All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us um, as we celebrate uh, Native American Heritage Month here at the Matheson History Museum. Um, we are really delighted to welcome Professor Megizi Miguan to talk to us about our local Indigenous heritage. Um, my name is Caitlin Hoffmahoney. I'm the executive director here at the museum. Um, we are an independent nonprofit, so we rely on our memberships and donors to help us continue to put on these programs. Um, so if you like what you see today, um, we have a table at the back of the room where I will be uh, hanging out at the end of the day today. Um, so if you would like to become a member, we would love to have you join us. And I would also like to thank our sponsors for this program. Um, we are sponsored in part by Visit Gainesville, Alachua County, the City of Gainesville, and the State of Florida Division of Cultural Affairs. Um, so we are very grateful for their support to help us make these things happen. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nicole to speak with us about our history. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Right. Buju. Hello. Megizi McGuan and Deshnika. We'll get to that point. Uh, thank you for coming here for the celebration of American Indian Heritage Month. Uh, in celebration of that month, we uh, honor those ancestors that came before us that did the good work to get us all here today. Um, we're going to begin today um, with every part of this is about uh, honoring uh, American Indians here in the United States. I'm going to start with an Ojibwa protocol um, greeting. And as I explained it to one young journalist, not you, but I said, you know, think of Game of Thrones. I'm going to give you the whole line of, you know, who my family is, just who my people are. And after that greeting, then I'm going to do a land acknowledgement to thank those that came before us. And then we'll get into the meat of this. Most of what we're going to talk about today are going to be um, the earliest indigenous during contact. The ones that were misnamed the Tamakwa, and we'll get to why they got that name. The ones here local in Alachua County, the Utina and the Patano. Um, so, without further ado. Buju Anishnabe, and Dinawe Maganadok, Migizi Maguan Nadeshnika, Bawatinga Jibwa, Minowa Krikatria Dawa, Makwa Dodum, Chimising, now I live in Gainesville, Florida, Mino Gizigad, today is a good day. Miigwech, Miigwech, Miigwech. Thank you all for being here. So, this is an Ojibwe uh, protocol greeting saying hi to you and all of my relatives. All of my relatives, including uh, the four legged animals, the birds, the plants, anything that um, is I'm related to or have been related to in my life. That's all of us. Um, and it tells you who I am from, where I'm from, uh, the clan that I'm from. And this is respect for those I came from and respect for you as well. Um, to give that official greeting and to once again, thank you for being here because us together is uh, doing our part to honor this month. So next I'd like to have a land acknowledgement. Maybe. And for the land acknowledgement, I want to thank once again, the Patano who came before us. I want to thank the Utina that came before us. I want to take that mislabeled group called the Tamakwa that came before us, the Alachua Seminole that came before us, the caretakers before them that we do not name except for archaeologically. And I want to thank all of them for taking care of this land. Now it's our obligation to do that, take care of the land, and leave it to our ancestors and our children and everyone that comes after to do their part. So when I came here to Gainesville, Florida, I came to the University of Florida to, to pursue my PhD. And I really felt in a lot of ways when I came here in 2005 that there wasn't enough when it came to acknowledgement of the indigenous. And I especially got involved locally when we celebrated 150 years of Gainesville. And I said, hey, guess what? <laughs> there was stuff before 150 years ago. And my good friend, Elizabeth Hawk, got me involved locally on local boards. Uh, I briefly served on the Historic Preservation Board. I'm now on the Alachua County Historic Board. Um, and we're doing our parts and we're seeing the efforts being made. Sylvia, thank you for your work in getting um, the plaque down at City Hall, working with UF uh, linguistics professor, Aaron Broadwell, to do the Timakwa 
uh, translation for that plaque. The naming of Cuscawilla. We took the camp, the YMCA camp south of town. I work with a Seminole tribe to rename that in honor of the Seminole that used to live in that area. So we keep doing more and more work and this accumulation is getting us to a place where we're starting to really recognize the groups of people that were here before us and to thank and honor them. So whose land are you on? Well, if you're from Alachua County, I just gave you that answer. But if you're not, as plenty of us aren't, somebody just mentioned they're living in New Mexico now, you can go to this website and you can type in your zip code and you can ask them whose land you're on and they'll let you know. Now, if you're outside of America, New Zealand, Australia, you might have to wait for an email back, but they will tell you whose land you're on. So, the indigenous here in North America, there's at least 30 million indigenous in North America. And so when it comes to the United States, for example, 574 federally, federally recognized tribes, 40% being in Alaska. And that number has gone up significantly in the last decade, in the last census, because now that we recognize uh, multiracial significance, more and more people self-identify as having indigenous roots. The same can be said First Nations people in Canada, 630 recognized tribes in Canada. And then in Mexico, interestingly enough, they don't recognize per race, they recognize by ethnic group, 68 distinct ethnic groups in Mexico. I think I, hopefully I just said Mexico. Mexico, um, but with those 68 groups, 364 variants of that group, and 19% of Mexico self-identifying as indigenous. So North America still maintains a massive indigenous population. And so today we'll continue on and look at our local area. Maybe. Am I doing something wrong, Caitlin? All right. In terms of local, we'll start with just the basics of the archaeological finds. The difference between archaeologists and historians is pretty much archaeologists dig the stuff out of the ground and we do a lot of the writing about that stuff. Um, that's, you know, the basics between archaeology and historians. So archaeologically, there has been, especially with dugout canoes, Massive amounts, more than anywhere else in North America, dugout canoes in Florida have been discovered and found. You can see one as you enter the Matheson Museum. Of course, pottery shards, and specifically here in Florida, middens. Um, if you've gone to the Natural History Museum, the middens that are really, they were refuse heaps. They were, you know, the garbage, the throw-offs of shells, um, bones, corn cobs that we could then go through and carbon date and look at these different groups of people most of them being prehistoric, just a history term we use for people that didn't often use a written language. So not using a written language for those people in Florida, other groups did, for example. For example, um, the Incas, the Incas used uh, quipus. There were these knotted strings that were still trying to figure out how they retain their history. Um, the Mayans used glyphs. Um, the Eastwind Woodlands use wampum belts where they tell stories and, and, and shared treaties using these, these um, um, shells that they put together in strings and belts and they traded with each other and they still have those to date. So there are, were ways that people maintain their history. So the finding of all these things got us to uh, the Deptford culture here from Savannah to the Panhandle some of the oldest, uh, the oldest layer at the UF Law School that has the plaque for the burial mound was this culture. Other cultures, the Cades Pond culture, migrants of the Deptford that came to this area. The Alachua culture, specifically here, the settlement um, contrasted with the Cades Pond. And they use that fertile soil, the well-drained soil that had already been established. And what I'm getting to, the point I'm getting to with this is we see over and over in Florida, where places have been cultivated, where places have been settled, they get resettled. Because if you think thousands of years ago, the difficulty of clearing fields, of burning down fields, of clearing land, somebody did it before you got here, thank you for that person. And then you could go live on that land without having to do all that hard work. 
Uh, once again, the Europeans did it all the time. They loved when they got to America and there'd just been a horrible pandemic or epidemic of a group. They were wiped out, but look at this great land. It's all cleared and ready for us to live on. And so similarly, we will see different tribes and cultures doing this. Am I not pressing the button right? <laughs> all right. This is an artist depiction of some of the local tribes that you can find in all of Florida. Um, all of Florida, the uh, Calusa are one that we're going to talk about today. They'll be the first that had a run in with Ponce de Leon. Um, the IS on the right there up to the Muscogee uh, had what it's called a black drink that we're going to talk about today. The trade routes were massive for these people, something we don't often think about. The Appalachee are at the Osceola River. They mark the boundary between who we call the Tamaqua. So the Tamaqua, as you can see in the middle there, that was an identifier by the Spanish. And that Spanish terminology was then used by the French, the Mugwa. And that grouping, that group, and then that word we now use after 200 years in use, other people started to self-identify. Because once you've been called something for two centuries, you say, okay, I'm that something. And so that something was between 35 and 100 different chiefdoms that warred with each other, that were not allied with each other, but they happen to speak the same language. So we're going to talk about at least five of those today. So European encounters. You're going to find a really similar um, storyline in the first three of these. And if there's any ad majors out there, maybe you can utilize this in your Welcome to Florida campaign. So, Ponce de Leon, 1492, of course, Columbus and his ilk came to the Caribbean. As soon as the Spanish came to the Caribbean, they started island hopping because it was so easy to, easy to do. They had seen the land of Florida and they assumed it was just simply a much bigger island. Uh, and that assumption, of course, held because they had gone through so many islands. So. Ponce de Leon was tasked by the King of Spain to go explore and colonize Florida. 1513, he landed in Florida. And as once again, as one could imagine, in a lot of ways, South Florida is a great place to see and be because there's food that just washes up on the shore for you. There is vegetation that you can eat. The Calusa specifically were not farmers like the Tamaqua were. The Tamaqua were cultivated the land. They were farmers. They cultivated the three sisters. The Calusa didn't, uh, presumably because they just simply had enough of a food supply that it wasn't a necessity. So when Ponce de Leon came in 1513, lovely, great place to see. However, it was incredibly difficult at that time not to get other people interested to start coming into Florida and seeing what they could see and starting taking the people from here to enslave them in the Caribbean. And so with all these unauthorized uh, excursions into South Florida, the king said, hey, I told you, you need to go explore, you need to go settle. So in 1521, he bought, brought more men, he went to go settle, and unfortunately for him, the landing for the second expedition was far too close to a Calusa town, a major Calusa town. And in their defense, knowing that these individuals were stopping in, not for their best interest, um, they attacked him and his people. Presumably what they killed him was with a poison arrow from uh, the machineal. The If you've ever heard of that beech apple, the very poisonous, incredibly toxic plant that grows along the beaches that you're not supposed to even touch. Um, he was shot with a poison arrow and on his way home, he died. Which of course then brought up the king to say, all right, we need, you know, number two. You tried it out, let's get something else with more boats and more people. And that brings us to uh, Penfilo de Navarrez. And so Penfilo, he landed on the shores um, in, um, what does it say up there, 1527? I can't follow my notes and talk to you at the same time. <laughs> All right, he landed on the shores. And uh, when he landed, um, him and his ilk landed just north of Tampa um uh, to a hostile another hostile group and one can understand why there was hostility because the encounters thus far had been people landing on the shores likely spreading disease and also taking people to be enslaved 
And if not doing that, taking resources from those people. So of course there was gonna be hostility. When he lands north of Tampa, meets with hostility, he breaks up his expedition of 400 people. All right, 300 of us are gonna go over land. The other 100 take the boat and we'll meet up north because rumor has it, there's a great port up north we should meet at. Of course, they never saw each other again. When him and his overland group got to around St. Mark, um, they created rafts and they were going to try to raft back down to Mexico to where they definitely knew that the capital was and they needed to get to. And in a storm uh, by the Mississippi River, all but four were lost. And so once again, welcome to Florida. There's hostels, bad weather, uh, poison, and uh, then we'll get to the next guy that's going to perish. Hernando de Soto. This expedition, though, really was one of exploration and much more success compared to the previous two expeditions. As I mentioned, he learned from his predecessors. He got more stuff, more people, more boats, and he actually had the good luck of running across a man named uh, Juan Ortiz. When he landed, which we believe by Charlotte Harbor, uh, Fort Myers area, just north of there, there was a rumor that there was a Spanish guy hanging out because Juan Ortiz had went to Florida to help find the Nav uh, Navarez expedition. He, you know, his friends got lost. I'll go there and help you. He got here and he got captured. And he was held by, uh, he was held by a Tamaqua speaking tribe for 11 years. To the benefit of DeSoto, that meant he spoke Spanish and Tamaqua. So when DeSoto got here, he had the luxury of having somebody with knowledge, somebody with language skills. And so when he came here to Florida, he picked him up and said, you know, you're going to be part of this expedition with me. Let's head north. So as you can see here from um, this map here on the left, as he's heading up north, the first couple of tribes, uh, people he meets, um, the Tamaqua language wasn't necessarily their, their language. There was a uh, 10 different dialects of Tamaqua. It's like any other language, there's different dialects and we get that from the Spanish writings. So as he's heading up, he gets to uh, Luca, he sees cornfields. These people have corn. He's heading north to places that we should recognize like the Ocali territory, modern day Ocala. Um, and he's heading up into um, the Patano. The Patano are the ones that were based in Evanston by Orange Lake, the Patano tribe, uh, which he went by and, you know, ate some corn with them, showed his dominance and all the materials and men and horses and everything he had, and he continu continued on his journey. Um, as he went up the uh, Utina, this is where from the Hernando de Soto 1539, for about the next 20 years, they're going to say, hi, we're the Spanish, and then they're going to ignore them for 20 years. They're not going to settle this area. They're just going to give a quick hi, let's map you out. By the way, we'll be back in 20 years to subjugate you. As they head north, the Utina were located in what we believe is modern day uh, Devil's Mill Hopper by the Fox Pond area. But somewhere between that 20 years, the Patano and the Utina warred with each other. They once again were enemies of each other and the Utina get pushed north. So when we get to the mission time period, the Utina will be in like Columbia County. If you go up Lake City area, that's where you find the Utina. And then the Patano will get pushed up from Orange Lake into the Devil's Mill Hopper area. So he'll continue his travels north and um, he'll continue through Temecua territory until he gets to the Osceola River, the Apalachee, and the Apalachee are a different language family, a different tribe of people, and they will be the border of the Temecua to the west in Florida. So one thing we don't always think about when it comes to indigenous is how dynamic their communities were and how much their trade routes went across the nation into Canada, down into South America. We often think of them as isolated. We think of them as stagnant. Um, but instead, in fact, this is where we got to love archaeology. There were items that were found here in Florida that couldn't have been discovered any other way than through a massive trade network. And the same thing goes for elsewhere. 
So one of the things, for example, on the far right map, in the green area was a city called Cahokia. Cahokia was the biggest pre-Columbian city in North America um, outside of the Aztecs and the Incas, which were in South America. Um, at its height in the 1400s, it was 20,000 people. It was huge. And it's really possible at this time, this is where corn came from. Because for the indigenous, from the Southwest to Florida, to the Midwest, to the Northeast, three sisters, this companion uh, crop planting is important to a vast amount of people. But when the middens were discovered and the corn cobs were found, they were only about from the 1400s. So clearly corn planting here in Florida hadn't come here much before the Spanish had got here. And it's possible it was that link with the Cahokia. But other things that were discovered, for example, um, there was what are called Celts. Celts, much like Celts, like Celtics, same word, totally different meaning. If you think of like an axe and the sharp part of it, just that part was discovered. And one of them was made out of copper from the Great Lakes, discovered here in Florida. There was, there's mica from uh, North Georgia. Um, so there was clearly this dynamic trade system that was going on. Certainly these tribes warred with each other at certain points, but at other times there was definitely back and forth across the United States of these tribes. Thank you. So before we start talking about food, which is one of my favorite things to talk about, and I'll get into that because it's so important to me. Um, five years ago, historians, including what I consider to be uh, the best historian on the Timucua, uh, Gerald Milinich, was going through and he had been using these engravings that I'm going to show you. These engravings by, by a European guy named Theodore Debris. Theodore Debris was working off of watercolors from a French artist who had come to Florida in the 1560s named Jacques Lemoyne. Well, what they discovered about five years ago is there's a bunch of stuff that's wrong. <laughs> they recognize that although this European man was working off watercolors from another person that visited Florida, things like this palisade are incorrect. They've never discovered a Tamukwa village where it was encircled with these posts. But some other things he did get right. So like these houses, which the Tamukwa call Paha, these pahas were thatched houses, usually one room, um, a sleeping area with furs for a bed, uh, a small fire area to keep bugs away. Um, and there was a council house in the middle. Council house was a bit bigger with benches so everyone could attend. Um, of course, the chief's house might be a bit bigger still. Um, but And then outside of it, you see right in the entrance to the palisade, this is something that we do believe existed. This is a little sentry tower where you're keeping watch for the village. Oftentimes that watch might be for enemies or things like alligators. And so you're worried about things coming in and attacking your village. Let's have someone station out here in this little, like very few windows, you can look around 360 and make sure it doesn't get um, attacked. But we're still gonna use these because a couple of things. We recognize the discrepancies and the problems with these engravings, but he was also working off of watercolors from somebody who was here in Florida and writings, writings from the Spanish, writings from the French that actually did influence his work. Unfortunately, the things he didn't know, he filled in either with Brazilian tribes, North Carolina tribes, um, his own European perspective. And next, please. And so we see like Tamakwa women. When I look at these women, uh, I don't automatically think indigenous. <laughs> That's not my first thought. But these Tamakwa women are working the field. Also, the size of the field might be a little off because the villages, as I just said, most of the small villages were 50 to um, 300 people. And for the Tamakwa, because once again, the Spanish got here, the big exploration, 1539 didn't really return for about 20 years. They had seen it, they know what it was about. 
the estimates are between 100 and 200,000 to Mukwa who were living from Ocala to Jacksonville. And so that 100 to 200,000 indigenous living here were living here in villages 50 to 300 people. There was one village that was uh, 2,500 people. That was an anomaly. That was the big village. So these little villages, they generally, when you're planning, you might not just have these massive, massive um, kind of garden or um, gardens, as it were. You'd have smaller ones, more localized ones next to you. Because I repeat again, to having to clear land, to having to do the work to here in Florida, especially Central Florida with the amount of trees we have, that would be extensive. But we start to see the women here cultivating, they're wearing their moss skirts. The men here are tilling up the soil and they're doing the planting, especially of, once again, the three sisters. The corn that had come in the 1400s, beans and squash or pumpkin. We definitely know what we believe to be pumpkin here in uh, Florida because one of the villages that DeSoto raided, they evacuated before he got there. And he said he and his men for four days feasted upon corn, um, pumpkin and beans. And certainly that had to be a treasure trove to be marching through Florida and find all these resources. We also see a divide um, in terms of gender and labor. For a lot of Europeans, cultivating of the soil had become a man's role rather than woman's role. And so we're gonna start to see a couple of cultural divides develop. Thank you, Caitlin. So as I said with the last slide, not a lot of those people to me look necessarily indigenous. And one of the big problems for the Tamakwa is everyone reported that they were heavily tattooed, heavily tattooed. In the last slide, there weren't any tattoos. And children started to get tattoos from a young age when they got a responsibility to, you know, haul my stuff into the Matheson kid. Maybe I'll, you know, tattoo you up when we get home. Not going to do that. Don't call CPS. Um, <laughs> but this idea of having more responsibility as a youngster, starting early, red, black, blue, tattoos being a signifier. And we have these from um, these Tamaqua warrior from a man named John White. Now, John White, just like Lemoyne, had visited America, but he'd visited North Carolina, not Florida. So once again, he used his knowledge of like Carolinian Indians and the knowledge of that they were tattooed and the watercolors from Lemoyne. But if you think about it, you know, I've been standing here for 15, 30 minutes. If I did this, could you go home and replicate my tattoo, right? I mean, just that idea that you've been staring at me, but if the words don't mean anything, how could you go back and be like, that's what was written on her arm. I have no idea what it means. So the same idea is some of these tattoos might be of a European perspective, might be from the Carolinians, but at least they are starting to depict a different group. So the warrior on the left here, the gorget he has, um, likely from a Spanish um, ship that hit the coast, they started to pillage gold and silver that, you know, when the ships shipwrecked, they could find it on the coast and started to use that material because there wasn't a tremendous amount of gold or silver in Florida. Uh, in fact, if you go over to Jacksonville, there's not a, lot, a tremendous amount of rock, which is why they had middens and they why they used coquina. Um, you had to come here more to Gainesville to actually have access to rock. So this gorget showing probably a chief, the breech cloth, the top knotted hair. And what was extraordinarily striking for the Spanish is the Tamaqua were on average four inches taller than they were, than the Spanish were. So they encountered this group of people much taller than they were. Uh, the woman, the wife, um, once again, tattooed, moss or fur or hide kind of clothing. Um, she's holding there a bowl for uh, corn, so corn cobs. And so we know this being an important staple of their diet. Next slide, please. And so to get back to food, because I love food, makes me so happy. Please, before you leave here today, enjoy some of the food that got donated to us by Northwest Grill. Thank you, Northwest Grill. Um, and I specifically got gator tail. So, you know, before they get you, we're going to get them. Okay. The companion flanding, the three sisters. So that John White I was talking about had went to a town in North Carolina. And this North Carolina town 
many tribes here in America before contact were farmers. They cultivated. Some of them had to give that up because you have to have a certain amount of peace to cultivate and farm. If you're not there during harvest, the whole point of it is lost. And so we have this companion planting, this intercropping of maize, beans, squash or pumpkin, depending on your geography, and on all working hand in hand with each other. So the corn, as it grows up, of course, you got the stalks of the corn, the beans that grow up around them help support that stalk and help grow up around it, adding nitrogen back into the ground. And then the squash or the pumpkin, depending on where you're at in America, because climate matters, um, will grow down at the bottom to retain moisture in the ground. And some of them have like prickly leaves to keep away like small animals. So this companion planting, uh, back of the New York quarter has the three sisters on it. We hope here in Gainesville to get Cuscawilla or the Blunt Center or both to start growing a heritage garden with these plants. They're still very important in the Southwest. And if you think just for a moment, because I love to think about food, this is gonna be a common theme. How many things that come from just those things I mentioned? Polenta, tamales, um, ratatouille, where you take eggplant and squash, uh, popcorn, grilled corn, any kind of corn, pumpkin pie. I mean, all these things are gonna be part of what I'm gonna ask for you to do today. The next meal you get, maybe the gator tail or the mushrooms, you can think about the crossover of old world and new world crops and how important it is to our diet. In fact, globally, people started to live longer after the Columbian exchange because of the exchange of foods both ways. Now we're giving it one way, later today I'll talk about where, what we get back from the Spanish that's important to America. Next slide. More food. Can't get away from it yet. So <laughs> the reason being, one of the projects we do at Santa Fe College is I work with USDA on Florida Heritage Foods. Um, down at the Blunt Center in December, we're going to have an all-day event if you're interested. Then there's going to be a Sacred Food Festival uh, December 12th. If you want to go to that, I'll be speaking at that as well because food is so darn important. Absolutely love it. So here we have the Timucua with what we would consider barbacoa, barbecue, a word that came from the Arawak and the Taino, from um, the Spanish who'd went through Hispaniola, went through Puerto Rico, came up into uh, Florida. And when they saw the Timucua um, smoking these meats, if you look closely here, it's as you would expect what you would get here in the middle of Florida. You know, you would get maybe a small deer. You would definitely get a snake, an alligator, a uh, fish. Uh, it's believed for the Tamaqua people, 85% of their diet was from the water, even here in Gainesville, because that's where you can easily go to the springs, get some fish out of it. Much easier than tracking down a deer. Um, and so you smoke this food and then you can keep it longer. If you know you have smoked food, you can, it can sustain you longer. But the diet was definitely very healthy for the group of people living here. The vitamins you get from those three sisters, the protein that was available. Once again, this is likely what led to them being four inches taller than the people they encountered because they had an incredibly healthy diet. Yeah, I love the alligators. Something we got to contend with here. And you can see on the left here, one of those little buildings that was at the front of the palisade um, where you could stand guard in one of these watchtowers. And I think he took a, maybe a little bit of poetic, poetic license with the size of these gators, or maybe they just ran a lot bigger in 1500s. But these massive alligators were mythical um, in this planning, but still, Everyone in the community had to come out and protect the community. You're going to go out and protect your family and small children if this gator comes upon your village. They tried to um, take long poles because you want to get as far away as you can. Little pointed pole. Try to flip it over because once you get that soft underbelly, then you can really go to work. Also, after it's done, you can eat. You can feast because we have alligator. Let's think about these after uh, after the discussion, we can go have some alligator and thank uh, the Timakwa for, you know, turning us on to this. All right, and so let's start talking about some contact. 
So the next 25 years, really, like I said, DeSoto came through, mapped it out, died, and really ignored that group of people he had met in 1539 and 1540. It was the French that forced his hand because just like everywhere else, the realization of how much money the Spanish were making by the 1500s and for the next uh, 200 years, the Spanish would be pulling out 300 tons of silver from the new world per year. Overall, 150,000 tons of gold and silver was pulled out of the new world. Uh, today's numbers, that's about $11 billion worth. And so the French heard about this. The British heard about this. Everywhere in Europe heard about this. We need to go to the new world and do our own exploration and our own colonization. In addition, skirmishes in Europe impacted the new world. So mid 1500s France, they were having a massive, is that my kid? <laughs> kid? All right. Uh, mid 1500s France, they were having a massive religious fight between the Catholics and the Huguenots. And this religious fight spilled over here because the Huguenots were wanting to leave France rather than be part of um, getting executed for being Huguenots. And so if they were wealthy, they started getting ships together and said, hey, let's go create a Huguenot community. 1562, one of the first Huguenots, uh, Jean Rebolt, comes to do the exploration. Let's come look, see if this is an inhabitable place. Um, they kind of, they go by the St. John's River up north of Jacksonville and head north from there. And they head north up into by South Carolina where they create a failed colony, but they realize once again, much like the Spanish, this isn't a bad place to live, much like us now today. And so the Timucua who they uh, met, compared to us, they met what we believe to be the biggest chieftain of the Timucua. And you're going to see two or three different um, writings of this because just like I said, Tamakwa didn't have their own written language. So this is the English spelling, uh, Satcher Iwa. And then there's going to be a French spelling of it. But we know the chief, Satcher Iwa. He was the chief of that village of over 2,500 people I mentioned, living over by Jacksonville. And he met Jean Rebolt. Jean Rebolt said, hey, you know, I'm here. I claim this for France, just like the Spanish had claimed it for Spain. I claim this for France and I'm going to put up this huge monument, this stone monument with our coat of arms to prove that it is our land. Now, if you go over there, there's still a monument there, not the original, of course, but there's a monument to mark where he landed. Like I said, he went up north and he decided this is a good place to settle. He sent his second in command back with settlers, with colonists in 1564. Um, his second in command a man was na named Laudener. Sorry, next slide, please. His second in command was a man named Rene uh, Laudener. And Rene Laudener got back in 1564 with a huge group of Huguenots plus others. Because when it came to European exploration, you would have naval officers heading up, you know, the military aspect of it. You would have also wealthy second sons, because with primogenitor in Europe, first sons got the land, they got the title, they got the wealth. Second son got nothing. So second son might say, hey, Laudner, I'll go on this expedition and help found a colony with you. You and, uh, you know, 300 Huguenots that want to get out of France so they don't get executed. And that means all kinds of families, men, women, children, you know, um, people that could do blacksmith, uh, blacksmith, seamstress, any kind of um, person you would need to make a colony. And so the French are going to force the Spanish's hand, Spain's hand, by coming here in 1564 and settling along the St. John's River. They're going to create a, uh, a colony called Fort Caroline. Fort Caroline, you can still go to uh, north of Jacksonville and um, visit that today. And they formed this Huguenot colony. And they got here in the spring of 1564. Spring of 1564, first thing they want to do is make friends with the local people. So the Satcher, uh, Satcher Iwa, the Satcher Iwa meet with the French. Satcher Iwa bring seven, eight hundred of his tribe because when you meet somebody that once again showcases, 
This is how big I am. This is who you are. What do you have for us? This is what we have for you. And so gift giving was a huge part of creating of alliances. And so there was a lot of corn that was given, a lot of food stuff that was given. And naturally the French thought, well, we can just live off this. We don't need to farm. Also, it's the middle of summer. We'll just let the Indians keep feeding us and we'll live off their food stuff. Well, unfortunately that's gonna end because when it came to that alliance, the understanding by the Satriwa was if we have an alliance, then when I go to war with my enemy, you have my back and you're gonna go militarily with me. So when it came to the Tamakwa, one of the major, um, there's gonna be three different ones we'll talk about. The Shatru Iwa um, oftentimes warred with the Utina who were in the middle to the Patano. So here we have the Patano in this area, in the middle north and east of us are the Utina. And then once again, north and east of them are the Satcher Iwa, and they all warred with each other. So if we're gonna go to war, you're gonna help us. Yeah, you can put the next slide. And so what starts to happen is the head of the Satcher Iwa had an alliance with the Spanish. This is where it gets started in real tricky, real days of our lives stuff. So his underlings, the French underlings, all they wanted to do was get rich and go home because they were from nobility. They didn't care about building a Huguenot society. They didn't care about farming and living here. They wanted to make money. And they went out exploring the interior and found the Utina, the neighbor that was the enemy of the Satchariwa. And the Utina said, yeah, we have all this silver, let me show you. And presumably the ships that had run aground, they had gotten about five pounds of silver altogether, which is pretty significant and said, come be our allies against the other ones that you're allies with, and let's take them over and we can trade. And this is where the division happens. So the French are divided, the indigenous are divided, the Satchiwa say, okay, we need to go to war and the French aren't coming with us, so our alliance is over. And also you French who went and formed your own alliance, you're out of it too, go live with them. You're out of the, you're out of the club. And this happens like, once again, the motivations of 300 different people, they go over and over. One, one Frenchman actually married into an indigenous group. He married the daughter of the chief. Hey, I have all these manufactured goods. I'm with the French. Marry me into the tribe and we can trade. Well, that worked all in good until he stopped trading. And then they put an ax in his head and said, we'll just take your stuff. All right. So. Thank you. All right. So once again, so we have all these motivations and all these different people. We have the Utina that want to have an alliance with the French so they can then go, you know, um, destroy their enemy, the Patano. They want to go both directions. You know, all these tribes had been warring with each other for hundreds of years before the French got here. And then the Spanish are looking on because if you think about the Caribbean, there are people that mutinied all the time. There's people that ran away. They knew the French were here. They knew they'd come in 1562. They knew they came again in 1564. And for the Spanish, this is their land. And so not only did the French come, but it was a Huguenot colony. And that's gonna be the problem. And so the French are getting, you know, all these alliances with this chiefdom and this chiefdom and the Spanish are gonna come settle this. So next slide, please. So the continued tribal wars, the different spelling by the French, uh, the, the what, Satcher Iwana, the Utino, the Patano. And so this is how we derive their names. That warring is for a minute gonna come to an end because 1564, um, spring of 1564, Fort Caroline was created. 
Um, after its creation, just like a lot of colonies, you hear this over and over, um, Laudonnier was ready to just give it up. He was ready to just cash it in and go back to France because they didn't have enough supplies. They had angered their alliance. They had angered the Satcher Iwa. They weren't giving them food anymore. They were starving. Um, so their, their colony and their, their fort wasn't making it. But then, of course, in the summer, his commander, Jean Ribault, came back with five ships and 800 new settlers and all kinds of supplies and hurrah, we're saved. But that's August. September, the Spanish are gonna come up. They're gonna come up from the Caribbean. They're not concerned at all about indigenous alliances. All they're gonna do is kill the French. Next slide, please. Oh man, this isn't it. <laughs> all right, uh, try to go back two or three, I'll keep talking. Um, so, one more, we'll just go back to this one. So, yeah, down at the bottom here. So, with, with the French here, and being Huguenots, Protestants, and living on what the Spanish considered their land, when they came back under uh, Pedro uh, Menendez, Pedro Menendez was going to have holy war against the French. This wasn't about you just invaded our land. You're also Protestants, you're not Catholics, you're heathens, and you need to get out of our territory. And so when he came back up, both of the French and um, the Spanish had troubles with their boats because they had these massive boats and just you can't just run them down to shore and get off. You need to have harbors and you need to have the ability to have some deep harbors to get off. So for the Spanish, they're going to establish in 1565, as many of you know, St. Augustine. They pretty much, it was a rudimentary like little fort on um, a Tamaqua village called uh, Soloy for Chief Soloy, whose chiefdom it was. They took his council house and they had an alliance with him and said, hey, we're going to build this fort here. And then 40 miles north, there's this group of French that we're going to take care of. Well, the French knew as well because they had seen each other on the water that the Spanish were gonna come and attack them. And as the Spanish came to attack them, they surrounded them um, coming overland and they absolutely massacred the French. As you can see here at the bottom, the massacre at Matanzas. So if you've ever been to Matanzas, you know it means killings or slaughter or massacre because they absolutely massacred those new settlers that had just got here to the shores uh, of the St. John's River. About 40 uh, people survived, Jean, um, Jean Ribault not being one of them. Laudner ran into the interior with about 40 people. Fortunately that Jacques Lemoyne, the guy that drew this and drew all those other watercolors that kind of got usurped, um, survived and made it back to France. The Spanish um, didn't kill about 60 women and children. So out of about, 800 to 1,000 people, all but 100 were killed. And that's going to once again establish that European influence that's going to come here because now the Spanish are here to stay. They're in St. Augustine. The next 30 years, they're going to build up their settlement in St. Augustine. They're going to get attacked by Sir Francis Drake. They're going to get burned down, going to get attacked again. They're going to build it back up until, of course, eventually St. Augustine, they build the Castillo there um, to have a permanent fort and settlement. They're going to solidify, first of all, their alliances with those Tamaqua that live in the Jacksonville, St. Augustine area. That's going to be their first group. And then they're going to spread. Because throughout their 30 years of building up St. Augustine, they're going to continue to war with the Utina. They're going to continue to war with the Batano. Because those groups had no interest whatsoever in coming under Spanish rule. It's going to take until the 1590s for both of those, Utina and Batano, to agree to come under Spanish rule, to send tribute, send food, send um, young people to go labor for the Spanish. And that system is gonna be the mission system. If you could go back to the slide with the missions, thank you. So there's five phases of the mission systems. A mission might not be what presumably, if you think of a Spanish mission or a New Mexico mission, 
missions were generally, you took an Indian village, a Timucua village, an Appalachian village, any kind of village, you sent um, somebody to build a church there, and that was now your mission. So the mission was really a village where you had a church. There was two different kinds. There was a doctrina. The doctrina was where um, the friar lived and the visitas. Visitas is where the villages around there that he would go visit. And so that uh, mission system, as it built up, tried it in 1560s, it failed. The ones we're going to talk about today are the ones that we still archaeologically have found the remnants of, specifically here in Gainesville, Florida. So this mission system, incredibly important for two reasons. Um, one could say conversion was one of them. I would, I should have put that number two. Food stuff and labor system. The labor system of the indigenous and having a food supply for the Spanish. Those are gonna be the important things. Mission system is gonna be more successful in the 1600s. Next slide, please. So here in Gainesville, Florida, if you've ever been to San Velasco, uh, there was a mission that was built in 1606. This mission was called San Francisco de Patano. So it was the mission for the Patano people. It was the Detrina, and it was the first mission outside of the St. John's River. So it tells us two things, the importance of the size of the Patano and the desire to subjugate that group of people to make them under Spanish rule. And so a church was built there and we can see the archeological evidence. So if you ever go to the San Velasco hammock, San Velasco was just simply a corruption of San Francisco. So it was based upon the missions that were there. Um, in 1606, we see uh, three different missions built, uh, built up in that area within a five mile radius. The one you see here, San Francisco de Patano, village of 400, the biggest, Santa Ana de Patano, and San Miguel de Patano. And then a year or two later, we have one down in Evanston. Because as I mentioned, when DeSoto first got here, the Patano were on Orange Lake in Evanston. What happened when the Spanish got more involved from 1560 to 1590 is constant warring with the Patano. In 1584, they were killing each other and they crushed the Patano and they forced them all to migrate here to Devil's Mill Hop Air area in Gainesville, Florida. So not their natural homelands, but a place that had been inhabited previously by the Utina. Next slide, please. And so this mission system that built up, it will be incredibly important for the next 100 years, 1600 to 1700. It's what dominates and helps Spanish Florida be Spanish Florida. It provided the food stuff. It provided the labor. Um, these missions built on villages, though, oftentimes did not work out for many reasons. Easily enough, disease. 1612 to 1616, about 10,000 indigenous died from an unknown, unknown disease. 1649 to 50, smallpox hit. 1655, measles hit. So we have these constant um, death due to war, disease, people running away, not wanting to be part of the Spanish, moving into the interior, not to be um, part of that uh, group anymore. Uh, people coming in and enslaving indigenous and taking them out of uh, Florida. So we see these missions come and go. So I just mentioned, for example, um, the, the ones I just mentioned, Miguel and Anna, within two years, they were gone because there just wasn't enough people. They kept dying over and over. The Tamaqua Patano, um, the Tamaqua, 100 to 200,000 people in 1500 became about 20,000 by 1600. 1700, maybe 1,000. 1763, 60 to 70. And so that kind of destruction had everything I just mentioned, war, disease, running away from not wanting to live under Spanish rule, getting enslaved, all of this just absolutely destroyed the people that had been living here. And this mission system, as it built up, you can see over on the side there, places start to die because of attrition. And then in the 1670s and 1680s, the British. 
the British had started colonizing north of Florida, uh, you know, up Virginia, New England, 1607, 1620. By 1670, they're in the Carolinas. 1730s, they're in Georgia. And from 1670 to 1700, they're going to ally with indigenous and just attack these missions. Pretty much the mission system was done by 1700 because the British came in, they took their food supplies, they killed people, and they weren't indiscriminate if they were uh, Appalachia or Tamaqua or Patano or Utina. If you were at the mission and it was under Spanish rule, you were going to be part of the problem. Um, as it says here at the bottom, I believe, um, 160 Patano left by 1675. That's mission Indians, so the ones still under the system. No doubt people moved to the interior not to be part of this anymore. No doubt they left to go south, east, north to get away from this kind of violence and to try to go back to their natural way of living. So briefly, we'll talk about Queen Anne's War. No, we won't. We're going to talk about food before we get to war. Let's wrap up with food. Um, one of the important things that has to be mentioned, the Spanish brought a bunch of things from the old, uh, the old world to the new world that were important. Two specifically to North Florida are going to be oranges and cows. Oranges were great because when they brought in the orange from Spain, the, the Sevilla orange, you could just take those seeds and bring them back to any village and plant them by your village and yay, you have orange trees. Now this is the cattle. Cattle were essential to the Spanish empire because as you can see in the middle the bit there, that is gonna be this area, the Lechua Ranch. The Lechua Ranch, other than the St. John's area, was the biggest cattle ranch here in Florida. The amount of cows they had there was to feed everybody in the Spanish empire. And so that cow and the cattle ranching that's done here is essential for a couple of reasons transforms the landscape, and it gets us to the Alachua Seminole. Anyone know the name of the first chief of the Alachua Seminole? He's gonna come, Ahaya, and his English name? Cowkeeper. Yeah, so Ahaya meaning chief. Uh, Ahaya is Muscogee for, for chief, and cowkeeper, because he's gonna come here, it's gonna be all these glorious cattle, that came from when the Spanish left and you couldn't get all your cows somewhere out there roaming, natural production. And when the Alachua Seminole get here, starting in the 1700s, 1720s, definitely by 1750, there's going to be all these great cows that are roaming around Payne's Prairie that are down by Micanopy. And they're going to be able to, you know, use that for their food supply. And seven, 1637. Francisco Menendez, uh, an ancestor of the guy that helped create St. Augustine, um, he gets 87 square miles, uh, largest cattle ranch in La Florida, La Chua, the Tamaqua word for hole or sinkhole, because if you've been to Payne's Prairie, you know it can um, become a sinkhole. And the numbers on this, I need to get um, somebody good with statistics, but there were 34 permanent ranches in Spanish Florida. And they paid a tax on 222 head of cattle. La Chua paid a tax on 77 head of cattle. So likely a third of all the cattle that was getting paid on was from La Chua Ranch. It was massive. Once again, 87 square miles was this ranch. So it was believed that within a two-year period, 3,000 calves were born on the ranch, largest cattle ranch. And so the food, the profit that came from this, not only did the British come down, but we now start having French pirates again. So the British are coming down raiding missions. The French are hearing about how great they are. And they start raiding into um, uh, Lachua County, into Lachua Ranch. So in 1684, they got attacked, demanding money and 150 head of cattle as ransom for taking uh, the owner of Lachua Ranch. Um, what also happens though with the cattle is they depreciate. They were worth 25 pesos in 1651 and two pesos in 1702. So you have all these cattle, but then they become less valuable because you have too many of them. Uh, so 
This cattle ranch in Lachua, runaway slaves would steal cows from it. Natives who were running away from the Spanish as well would steal cows from it. And then the Spanish invasion, and next slide. And the Queen Anne's War would get it to where we couldn't maintain that ranch anymore. The people who had the Lochua Ranch gave it up. They took as many cows as they could with them, but that still meant a significant amount were left here in Plains Prairie. So this Queen's Anne War, once again, how Europeans are impacting America. French pirates are coming in. French have allies with certain indigenous from the West. British are coming south from Carolinas to Georgia. They have alliances raiding the missions. The Spanish are weakening in terms of their desire to hold on to La Florida. And when it gets to the point of the wars on the European continent, that war is going to spill over here uh, to North America. And so this Queen Anne's conflict, steady decline of Spanish power, vacuum is going to be left uh, in central Florida as those last remaining Tamaqua start to move and migrate to St. Augustine if they're going to have protection. If you're a Mission Indian and you're still under the protection of the Spanish, you're not going to be living out in the interior by yourself anymore. You're going to be moving back to the military where you can get taken care of. And after Queen Anne's War, uh, we're going to have the Seven Years War in which Florida is going to go to the British. The land is going to go to the British because uh, the alliance and the losing of it in the Seven Years War. And by that time, the last 60 to 7 Tamaqua that were Mission Indians get on boats with the Spanish and head down to Cuba. Now, someday DNA testing will showcase probably likelihood the connection between those people from here that moved to Cuba. But also, this gets us somewhat to the next slide, please. To the debate that was on Facebook about the Alachua Seminole and whether they're from Florida or not. And this is part of American Indian Heritage Month where you listen to the indigenous. The tribe says we were always here. And there is a likelihood that with trade routes, that is a possibility. There's a likelihood that the Muscogean language is related to the Clusa, related to the Appalachie, that no doubt Tamagua that didn't want to be part of the Spanish mission system, Ocali, Patano, Utina, they all became absorbed in part of this group called the Seminole. Because the Seminole are really unique in a lot of ways. We know a large base of them were from the Lower Creek who had allied with the British and raided the missions. They then were encouraged because this is how, uh, how unsure the Europeans were of alliances. They were encouraged by the Spanish to move into this territory as a buffer to the English, not realizing they were an ally of the English. So you have the Lower Muscogee Creek moving into this area. And as they move into this area, there are no doubt other indigenous who become part of their group. Now there's two words where we get the Seminole from. Cimarron is the Spanish version of runaway, but there's a Creek word that no doubt they got Cimarron was uh, Cimoli, meaning one that doesn't live within a major village. They live on the outskirts of it. And so this group of people considered themselves that because not only did they no doubt subsume the people that were living here that didn't want to be part of the Spanish, runaway slaves, free blacks were welcome into the tribe to build up numbers, to build up, because that builds up protection. When the Alachua Seminole moved here, they moved to Payne's Prairie, which after a year or two, they said it just smelled really bad. They headed south to Cuscawillo, just a mile or two down, uh, you know, if you're heading down 441, you get down to Cuscawilla, so they transfer because as they got here though to Prince Prairie, there's all these glorious cows. Thank you for the Spanish who left those behind. Next slide. Imagine you're, you know, moving out of your warlike land, you're moving out of, you know, violence, and you see this glorious patch of land that had already been cleared and settled. There's fresh water and animals. Next slide. And then there's cows. And so this is what gets us because whatever feral cows had been left by the Spanish, man, they are way easier to hunt than wild deer or alligator or snake or whatever else. And so when this group, this group of a bunch of different people, Creek, no doubt Tamaqua, runaway slave, 
free black, got together and started to live with each other. They found this massive food supply readily available here in Alachua County that they could live off of. And so that's why we have the first uh, Ahaya, as you said, Ahaya, the chief, might have been Sakofi. They believe there's Sakofi and Cowpeeper might be the same person or a single person, but the first chief was identified by, by William Bartram as Cowkeeper because he kept the cows because he's the one that organized them and fed his the people living here. And for the next generations to come, the Alachua Seminole will be settled here until, of course, we get to the Seminole Wars and kick them out too. All right, next slide. All right, so to wrap up, how does one honor indigenous people? Get this question all the time. Well, first of all, give me your money. <laughs> My husband said, maybe I'll get reparations today. It's not what I'm looking for. Donate your time, donate your money to causes. That's a great way. Another is to continue your education. The fact that you're here today, the fact that you're listening to me talk about the indigenous here, continuing on with that education, have conversations. Take this and the next group of people you see in your friend set or your family. Go tell them what you learned today. Um, you know, recognize indigenous foods. I'll, I'll stop on that. That'll be the last time I talk about it. Farms, restaurants, distilleries, native businesses. Listen to native voices and what they have to say. Um, oppose racist mascots. Watch an indigenous film. Listen to music. Enjoy the artwork. Um, implement a moment of silence for those that came before us, the caretakers of this land. Uh, finally, visit a museum like you're doing today. So that being said, please join me for a cocktail and some food. You can meet my son, Nibiwood McGeezy. And uh, thank you for coming out today. Miigwech. Caitlin, did you have a wrap up? We're good. Let's go. Let's drink and eat and be merry. Thanks, folks.